That must have been a very sorrowful walk from the hustle and bustle of the big city of Jerusalem to that little village called Emmaus. They were leaving Jerusalem sad. They were deeply, bitterly disappointed, these two. They'd put all of their hopes and dreams on that teacher from Nazareth, and now he was dead. And he died by the most public, the most excruciating kind of execution ever invented. He wasn't just killed, he was humiliated, he was exposed, and he was mocked. There was nothing pretty about crucifixion. I wonder if these two disciples had even been there at the hill called Golgotha. Perhaps they had stayed away, not being able to bear to see him die in that way. And then they just decided to leave the city. Why, why do we need to stay here any longer? It, it's over. So they thought. I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but after a tragedy and a great loss, there tends to be a kind of calm. When all of the tears have been cried, the funeral service is over, the mourning friends and family members have gone home, life has to slowly resume. And then we are left to ourselves to reflect on what has happened. That's when we try to come to terms with reality, to accept things as they are now, not as we want them to be, and to understand what we have seen and experienced. But sometimes, as hard as we try, we don't understand. And that's what makes life so difficult. Perhaps we could understand those things if we can make some sense out of them, even if those things are tragic and painful. There are some things that happen that have a sense of inevitability, like the death of an aging relative. We can, we can kind of see it coming. We can even do some of the grieving in advance and prepare ourselves for the blow when it comes. But then, again, there are life's sudden swift kicks in the solar plexus that leave us doubled over and gasping for breath. And those are the things that defy all trite explanations and pat answers. Now these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, to them the cross was one of those things. They were trying to come to terms with what had happened. To come to terms with the fact that Jesus was dead, but they clearly did not understand, nor could they explain what had actually happened back there in Jerusalem. If we look at the cross in its bare, stark reality, without any theological explanations, it does seem to be beyond understanding. It is simply a horrible tragedy, like so many other events in the sad history of the human race. We can perhaps, without any additional revelation, come to see Jesus as a brave young martyr who was dying for his radical beliefs. And martyrs are noble, though sad, and they are capable of inspiring us, even shaming us for our lack of devotion. But martyrs are dead all the same. Then what do we do? Well, we go back to the routine again. Back to normal life. These two disciples headed to Emmaus. The Bible says Peter went back to fishing. Life goes on. We should probably say it is the routine, the frustrating, pointless vain repetition that we call life that really goes on. Every now and then, there's this little flash of something different, something new and exciting that stirs our souls and starts us hoping that maybe real life has begun. Maybe something's going to change. Maybe something is going to happen that's different than everything before. But like Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Just the same old thing over and over again. But not in this account. Not in this account. These two disciples were never going to be able to go back to their old routines again. Something had happened that would give new meaning to everything under the sun. They were going to come face to face with life itself because Christ has risen Though they knew it not at this point, and everything seemed on the surface to be the same, but the gospel is new. It's something new indeed. News 
that something new has come into the world and things are never going to be the same again. Life has come. Life itself has come. Real life has come. And so now we can say that life does go on because eternal life has been revealed. He's brought life and immortality to light. Without the resurrection... The cross could not have been properly understood. Calvary was not just another human tragedy. And Jesus was not simply a courageous young martyr of another noble yet hopeless cause. There was a divine purpose that had been in the works for a long time, even before time itself. The resurrection is the linchpin of the Christian faith. Lynchpin meaning it holds it all together. We do not worship a dead martyr. Amen. We walk with a risen Christ. That's right. Now after the resurrection, we have to understand that Jesus has entered into a new mode or a new level of existence. The meaning of the ascension of Christ, which was the essential sequel to the resurrection, is that Jesus can now be anywhere and everywhere and is therefore always with his disciples, wherever they may be, in a locked upper room by the Sea of Galilee on the road to Emmaus, in a jail cell, or on the lonely Isle of Patmos. Jesus is with us because Jesus has risen. Now these resurrection appearances, this is one of those resurrection appearances. He appeared to his disciples on several different occasions. This is one of them in Luke chapter 24, these two disciples. One of them named was Cleopas. We don't know the name of the other one who were walking on that road to Emmaus. These resurrection appearances are for the purpose of preparing the disciples to become witnesses for Jesus. Jesus was going to send out these confused and timid souls who always seem to be a few steps behind where Jesus needs them to be. Up until this point, that was true. I'm not, getting, I'm not trying to criticize the disciples or the apostles, but you have to admit, is up until the resurrection, until the Lord appeared to them, and, and, and until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, most of the time these men didn't quite get it, what was going on. They weren't ready for this mission. But Jesus is going to make them ready. They needed confidence. They needed boldness. They needed faith. They needed to understand how everything that had happened fit together in God's great kingdom program. And so Jesus was going to spend 40 days with them, Luke says in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. He spent 40 days with them after his resurrection explaining the nature of the kingdom of God before he then ascended into heaven. And if I can read between the lines a little bit, I think Jesus prepared them in much the same way that he instructed these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He opened the scriptures to them. That was what they were missing, you see. They did not understand the scriptures. They had not yet made the right connections between what was written in the scriptures and what Jesus had done. That's what John said in John 20, verse 9, uh, when he and Peter went to the tomb and they looked in the tomb and they saw that the tomb was empty. And John says that he believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead when he saw that the tomb was empty. But But he adds, he says, but they did not yet understand from the scriptures that that had to happen. There is no greater handicap than not understanding the scriptures. But Jesus was not satisfied and is not satisfied with ignorance in his people. He is the authorized interpreter of scripture. Not only that, he is also the message of the scriptures. Jesus is the key to the entire Bible. And if we do not understand this, we will never be able to really understand. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration... How Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus. It says in Matthew 17, 3, and some of the other gospels record this also. Moses and Elijah appearing with Jesus. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing all the prophets of God. 
But in Matthew 17, 5, God spoke to them out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son. You must listen to Him. Jesus is the greater revelation. And the one the law and the prophets spoke about. That's why Paul could say in Romans 3, verse 21, that the gospel of Christ, this message of justification through faith, is in perfect agreement with the law and the prophets. So if you read the scriptures and you do not come to Jesus, if you read the scriptures and you miss Jesus, you've missed the whole point. It's like visiting Paris and not seeing the Eiffel Tower. Jesus warned the religious leaders about this serious error. He said to them in John 5, 39 and 40, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Amen. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And that is not an innocent mistake on their part. Amen. That is not an innocent mistake to be religious or to search the scriptures, but refuse to come to Jesus. That is not an innocent mistake. It is actually an evidence of unbelief. Yeah, right. yeah. Jesus, you see, exposed what people really believed about the scriptures. He, say, he went on to say in John 5, 46, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Yeah, so actually they didn't believe the scriptures. The religious elites knew the scriptures, but they did not know the author of the scriptures because they didn't really believe. Most of you probably know because I quote him all the time. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. But his works, if you've ever tried to read some of his more philosophical things, are filled with, with complicated arguments and a lot of intricate allegories. So what if I could talk with C.S. Lewis while I read the books that he had written? Do you think that would help? Do you think that he could give me some insights into his writings that I might have missed on my own? You see, if I could speak with the author of the book, I could understand his intended meaning. Now, I can't do that with C.S. Lewis and his books, but I can talk to Jesus about his book. Amen. Amen. You see, Jesus is a living presence right. who can walk with us and who can teach us. That's the significance of the resurrection and the Emmaus Road experience can be ours today. Why do we fail to understand Scripture? Why does anyone come to the Bible and they just say, I just don't understand what it means? Let's, let's talk about that. You can study the original language. You can study the principle of what we call hermeneutics or the science of interpretation. I'm not, I don't think that those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but they are insufficient. If we really want to understand Scripture, we must know the author of Scripture and the one who is himself the focus of the Scriptures. You see, we don't learn about Jesus like we learn about American history or about the multiplication table. There are certain facts that I can learn intellectually, but these have no impact on my life. I may read about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, all of the writers of the Constitution. I'm actually studying that right now. I'm studying political science at MSSU. And that may be, that may be inspiring and interesting in a sense, but it doesn't really change my life. It's just information. It's just facts. But this knowledge of Jesus is different. It is intensely personal. And we must be willing to listen to Jesus to follow him closely and to submit to him and what he teaches. And if we are not willing to do these things, then Jesus cannot teach us. Rather than learning from Jesus, there are many who would rather keep their personal freedom or what they think is freedom. They are at least free from Jesus. But the paradox of freedom is that we must submit ourselves to Christ first and to his teaching in order to be free. See, that's, that's kind of a paradox to, to, to the world that might not make a lot of sense. You mean in order to be free, I have to submit to someone? Yes. That's exactly what Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32. He said, if, if you abide in my word, 
you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you, do you see the progression there? Amen. You want to be free? Well, you have to abide in my word. You have to become my disciple. You have, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Bob Dylan was right. And if, if Brother Bob can, can sing a Johnny Cash song, I can quote Bob Dylan. He, says, he said, you are going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And he was exactly right. And I wish Bob had stayed uh, in his Christian faith. The more we serve Jesus, the more liberated we become. We were never meant to be on our own, to be our own master, just as a fish was never meant to live out of the water. Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are ever restless until we find rest in thee, Augustine said. Now those who resist Jesus are making themselves slaves to their own carnal minds with its dark ignorance and its raging passions. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's Romans 8, 7 and 8. What Paul is describing there is a moral problem. Why can't people understand the Bible? Why can't people understand spiritual things? Is it because they're not smart enough? Is it because they don't have enough education? They just lack common sense. They need to take a course in Greek or Hebrew or hermeneutics. No, there's a moral issue that has to be addressed in the heart of man. There's a part of us that naturally resists God and resists his word. We are children of our father Adam, you see. And we live in a world infected with the devil's spirit of rebellion against God. It's, just, it's kind of in the air we breathe, so to speak. This rebellion. The world's in rebellion against God. The world is proud, you see, of its unspiritual wisdom. And it laughs at the foolishness of the cross, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 31. And so, if this is the situation, if we are carnal, if we are resisting God, if we are infected with worldly wisdom and pride, that means that simply explaining the Bible and explaining spiritual things in simple language or translating the Bible into the language of the street, that by itself will not overcome this natural resistance we have to God. That's why Jesus had to tell a biblical scholar, an expert in the law, that he needed to be born again before he could see and really understand heavenly things and perceive the kingdom of God. That's John, that's of course Nicodemus in John 3, 3 through 12. In other words, the kingdom of God is spiritual, but we are unspiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. The purely human way of thinking is not God's way of thinking. And unless we get some help from heaven and unless there is some kind of radical change in us, we will never understand the things of God. Yeah. I'm talking here about why people misunderstand, can't understand the Bible, why we at one time did not understand the kingdom of God. Not only is the carnal mind a hindrance to our understanding of the scriptures and the truth of God, not only is the world a hindrance and worldly wisdom, but religious traditions can get in the way. Religious traditions, Jesus said, can nullify the word of God. That's exactly what Jesus said in, in Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9. He said, he said to the Jewish leaders, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your traditions. Religious traditions, religious ways of thinking can render the word of God powerless and ineffective in our minds. And the influence of false teaching that we have heard can linger in our minds like cobwebs in the corner of an old house. At some point, we've got to clean house and make room for the master to come and live there. Now, Jesus has his own agenda. If we want to pursue our own interests in life, we have to do so without Jesus. 
and people who read the Bible as if it is about them and their earthly lives, in essence, how can God help me get what I want out of life? Those kind of people will never be taught by Jesus. They can't be taught by Jesus. We have to take up our cross. And that means we must die to our own plans for life. That's what taking up your cross means. We have to do that before we can follow Jesus, before we can learn from him. You see, God has his own plans. God's busy building his kingdom. He's not going to build our kingdoms. God's wonderful plan for your life is for you to die to all the wonderful plans you have for your life. His plan and what he is building is infinitely better than anything we could have dreamed of anyway. Amen. So foolish for us to hang on to our little kingdoms when the kingdom of God is so much bigger and so much better. Amen. So God is not going to give us our dreams. He wants your dream to die. I know that sounds harsh. But he wants your dream to die so that he can give you an entirely new vision. Amen. It's not that God is going to take away from us and, not, and leave us poor. He's taking away those things that we're holding on to that we think are so important so that he can give us something that's really truly valuable. Amen. Now, if we are unwilling to take up our cross, if we're slow of heart, if we're unresponsive to the Lord's word, if we refuse to trust him, then our understanding will be hindered and it will be deficient. If our hearts are not right, then we will have to confess along with the psalmist that I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Psalm 73, 22. Animals run on instinct, you see, not on understanding. So it's good to be reminded to be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. Psalm 32, verse 9. In other words, don't, don't be like a, a wild animal that God has to, to, to put a, a, a harness on or a, tie a leash around and jerk you around and... Don't be like that. Don't be like that generation of rebellious Israelites in the wilderness who heard the word of God but turned away from him in their hearts. You see, we can listen without really hearing. Israel did it. So how does Jesus help us understand? That's what he did for these two men, these two disciples as they were walking to Emmaus. He Help them to understand. How does Jesus help us understand? Now the problem with these two disciples walking to Emmaus was not that they were unwilling to listen to Jesus. It's not that they were rebels. They had been disciples of Jesus. They had been following him in order to listen to his words. But clearly they were missing something. They clearly did not understand what the Christ would do. They probably had a political and earthly understanding of the kingdom of God. And they told Jesus dejectedly, we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. Well, he had redeemed Israel, but not as they expected, not in the way they expected. That earthly political vision of the Christ and his kingdom needed to be shattered because it was a false hope that did not come from God. But that misunderstanding that they had did not mean they were not devoted to Jesus. It is possible to be a devoted follower of Jesus and yet have an incomplete understanding. But Jesus does not mean for his people to remain that way. We must learn to recognize the difference between a person who is devoted to Jesus yet lacks understanding at some point and someone who is just disinterested. Let's be able to discern that in people that we, that we meet and talk to. A person who is truly disinterested can expect nothing from Jesus. They're not his disciple. But Jesus can work with a person who is interested, yet lacks understanding. Remember, there was a time when each of us lacked understanding of the scriptures in the kingdom of God. Let's not forget that. We may still have areas of deficiencies that we are perhaps not even fully aware of at this time. Remembering that we don't have a perfect understanding will help us be more patient and merciful to those 
whom we think are not at our level yet. In fact, we might not really be at the high level we think we are, and we should not become puffed up with pride because of our knowledge. Jesus did not appear to these disciples because they were disinterested in order to go boo and scare them into suddenly becoming devoted disciples. Jesus doesn't work that way. Jesus didn't appear to his enemies. He didn't appear to the Pharisees and say, boo, it's me, I'm back. Now what are you going to do? He didn't work that way. He appeared to his friends, to those who were devoted to following him, who believed in him, yet they did not quite understand what had happened. Now this process of learning from Jesus was a difficult process. This is not an easy thing. Some people oversimplify, I think, what it means to learn about the kingdom of God. As if it's something that you can just go to Sunday school for a few weeks and you, now you know about the kingdom of God. We've oversimplified this. Other people think that it's just an intellectual exercise. And if you read the right books, if you study long enough, if you go to the right theological school and graduate, then you will have this perfect understanding of the things of God. I'm sorry, but that's overly simplistic. That's an illusion. In fact, this simplistic or academic approach to the things of God can actually be a setback and can keep a person from really learning from Jesus. I'm not saying that we don't have to study the Bible and use our minds. I am saying that is not all that we need. Before we can really learn from Jesus, there will probably be some preparations that he has to make in us. You see, the farmer has to prepare the soil before he plants the seed, or the seed will fall on hard ground and never penetrate the soil. There are areas of our hearts and minds that must be plowed up before the Word of God can be planted there. We may have character flaws that must be addressed, old ways of thinking that need to be removed, and selfish desires that have to be crucified before we can learn from Jesus. And those kinds of things cannot be removed through academic information. Even after we are born again, these things are not instantaneously rooted out of our lives. The Lord will have to prepare us by showing us those areas of our lives that are deficient. This means that he will allow us, he will allow us to go through times of failure, disappointment, and pain so that the weaknesses in our character can be uncovered and therefore and thereby corrected. Now we often interpret that kind of, of instruction as the Lord's displeasure with us. You're going through it. You, you've made, you, you've failed. You're going through a hard time. We, we usually interpret those times of discouragement and that sort of thing as if the Lord is displeased with us. He, might, he must not be happy with us. Or maybe he's not there at all. Maybe he's just abandoned us. But actually, those are the Lord's discipline. He's treating us as sons. It is the Lord saying something like this to us. He's saying, Jason, that particular way of thinking, those goals that you had, that desire that you have, all need to be put away. You didn't get those things from me. And because you did not get those things from me, you will ultimately be disappointed when those things fall through. But what I want to give you will never fall through or disappoint you. And so you will have to let those things go, even if it is painful, so that I can give you something which can never be taken from you. Isn't that what he was doing to the two on the road to Emmaus, in a sense? They, they were so disappointed. They were so downcast. But he was preparing them to receive something eternal. We go through pain when we, learn, when we lose things because we're loving and valuing the wrong things. As we've said before, the world has switched the price tags and told us there is value in things that are not from God, things that will pass away and break our hearts in the end, but Jesus will never break your heart. It's the false hopes and vain promises of the world that will disappoint us, sometimes even of religious people that will disappoint us, but not the Lord. 
It is not the Lord's purpose to make all of our earthly hopes and dreams come true. As I've already said, the Lord wants to give us an entirely different vision and a completely new hope that is beyond anything this world can offer. The problem is that our desires are too weak. Our thinking is too small. He has to expand us. And if the Lord is busy breaking up your life, it's not because he wants to hurt you. He is tearing something down so that he can build something else. So let him have his way. Work with the Lord. Don't work against the Lord. I think the amazing thing is how patient the Lord is with us. He's so patient. Look how patient he was with his disciples and the two on the road to Emmaus. If we look back down the road we have traveled, we can remember places where the Lord gave us a lot of grace. He was very gentle with us. There were times when we were stubborn and were ashamed of how foolish we have been, but the Lord was still walking with us. He was still working on us. We probably didn't always know what he was up to, and we may have been even too blind to recognize his presence, but he was there beside us on the road. He was there with us in every circumstance and situation. He was there working with us in the form of other people whom he was using to teach us, even though we may not have recognized Christ in them. But he was there nonetheless. That's why the fellowship of saints is so crucial. Jesus is not just revealed to me. He's revealed to us. Amen. Now, no one, no one should think tonight that I am advocating some kind of subjective, mystical approach to understanding the Bible and the things of God. There have always been people who claim to have some kind of special line of communication with Jesus that no one else enjoys, and the way they understand the Bible, which happens to be different from everyone else, is the one true interpretation. There are those nutcases out there. It's the stuff coming from the cults. The Bible cannot mean just anything we want it to mean, and there is no replacement for carefully studying the scriptures. There are those overly spiritual people who tell us things like this, well, don't worship the Bible. Or someone might have said, and we've heard this here, put down the Bible and get to know the God of the Bible. Well, these kind of people who try to discourage us from knowing the scriptures are either trying to twist it themselves or are just lazy. They want a shortcut. But there is no shortcut to spiritual understanding. There is no shortcut to understanding the scriptures that bypasses our personal involvement and our use of our God-given faculties. One of the things the Jewish people had that we don't have today, even in the church, is familiarity with scripture. They knew scripture. The Jews were always reading scripture. That's what they did in the synagogues. And they treated it with great seriousness and reverence, even to the point of not even being willing to touch the pages of the, the Torah scroll. That does not mean they always understood it, because obviously they didn't. But when Jesus began to open the scriptures to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he was not talking to men who had never read the scriptures. That's right. The text of scripture was already in their minds like a seed that had been planted in soil. And it was Jesus who brought that seed to life and made it grow. Yeah. Jesus will do this again for the Jewish people in the future. Yes. But he will do, a, do it for us now, today. Now even for those of us who are familiar with the scripture... And I'm talking mostly to people who are and who love the Word of God. But it can lay around in our minds sometimes in broken fragments, like those fragments that they picked up after Jesus multiplied the loaves. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle with the pieces lying scattered across the dining room table. How do we put this picture together? Is there a picture to be seen? If the Bible is the Word of God, then we can expect God to have a single, consistent coherent revelation and not some kind of hodgepodge that goes down a thousand rabbit trails. So what is the word or the message that God has given us in the Bible? Men have argued about this and continue to argue about this. Only Jesus has the answer because only Jesus is the answer. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets he interpreted to them 
in the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's right. Amen. I wonder what Jesus said to them as they walked along the road. Maybe we can use a little sanctified imagination. Maybe Jesus told them something like this. Maybe he said, I'm the seed of the woman, and I just bruised the serpent's head. Maybe he said, I'm the seed of Abraham too, and God's going to bless the world through me. Maybe he said, I'm the Passover lamb who I've just been sacrificed. Maybe he said, I'm the prophet that Moses promised would come. Maybe he said, I'm the great high priest who has opened the way into the Holy of Holies. Maybe he said, I'm the true tabernacle in which the glory of God came to dwell among men. Maybe he said, I'm the true Joshua. Remember, Jesus' name is really the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew, Joshua, the Lord saves. He said, I'm the true Joshua, and I'm going to take my people into the promised land. Amen. Maybe he said, I'm the true kinsman redeemer of Ruth. Maybe he said, I'm the son that was promised to David who would sit on his throne forever. Maybe he said, I'm the king that God has set on his holy hill of Zion. Like it says in Psalm 2, against whom the nations will rage. Maybe he said, I'm the one that God briefly had forsaken on the cross as predicted in Psalm 22. Maybe he said, I'm the wisdom from God that is greater than that of Solomon. Maybe he said, I'm the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Maybe he said, I'm the guarantor of the new covenant promised in Jeremiah 31, and I put that covenant into effect by my own blood. Maybe he said, I'm the son of man that Daniel saw approaching the ancient of days to receive an eternal kingdom. Maybe he said, I am the sign of the prophet Jonah. As he opened the scriptures to them, it says their hearts began to burn. Their hearts burned with recognition. That's what that means. They, they knew the voice of the Lord. Uh, but their eyes didn't know him. <clears throat> and their minds were slow to understand. It's, it's, it was a voice they thought they would never hear again. And yet they were hearing it. You know, in the kingdom, hearing is always more important than seeing. Faith comes by hearing. It was their faith in the risen Lord that gave those first disciples the boldness to preach that Jesus was the Christ promised in the scriptures. Now, <clears throat> we should not expect to see him like they did. That's not what I mean when I say we can have an Emmaus Road experience. I'm not saying we, we can physically see the Lord. We should not expect that because now he's ascended. That's right. yeah. Remember he said when Mary, when, he, when Mary saw him and she fell at his feet and she grabbed on to him, remember he said, don't hold on to me. Yeah. What was he saying? He was saying, don't get used to this situation, That's right. Mary. That's right. That's right. I'm, I'm not staying here. He has ascended and he is not going to be seen until he comes again. But we can still hear his voice. Amen. He is still speaking from heaven. He is still speaking to us through the scriptures if we will listen to his voice. We do not see him, but he is with us and is still speaking to us. Long ago at many times and in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Right. Amen. Are you listening to Jesus? Amen. If you are, then I welcome you to the fellowship of the burning heart. Amen. Brother Michael is going to exhort us.